The ego is a hungry ghost always looking for more because it's constantly in a quest for superiority. And it's a necessary part of what advances life. This dominance creates breeding advantage or whatever. Like, it has a purpose, but it's never going to be fulfilled. Hello, lovelies. Welcome to Aubrey Marcus Podcast or Pirate Life Radio. I'm not sure. We're here, folks, and I'm a little late. My apologies. I just got back from Hawaii with my mom, Duncan Tressel. We brought uh, Steven Tyler, even came in. We didn't let him sing at all, but he just, you know, talked about old times with the band, uh, Ram Das. And then uh, after the retreat, man, which was incredible, a whole other thing, I think I got to do a, a, a podcast just with Duncan solo on this, but... Um, I got to see my friend Pat Silva and his boy Dante Silva, who's a little shredder on the surfboard, just a badass. And then uh, I got to have dinner with my good friend Kendall Grove, who I hadn't seen in ages, man. I hadn't seen since the Ultimate Fighter days. And we ate at Flatbreads in Maui, which I highly recommend. Oh, big wood oven. That's beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, it's in the most beautiful little city in Maui, too, man. It's amazing. The whole, the whole island, all, it's magical, man, all of Hawaii. The more I'm there, the more I'm blown away. Anyway, I've been just trying to get this goddamn podcast out with Aubrey for ages now. We did this a long time ago, and it's just been laying in this goddamn tech file. I love you guys, and uh, be well, and we'll get at you soon. A big Tate Fletcher. Powerful Tate Fletcher. Is a, is a real alpha male. Weightlifter. He's a stuntman. Movie star. Robust, enthusiastic individual. He's huge, by the way. He's like a monster person. One of the sweetest guys I know. He's bigger than life. Actor. Entrepreneur. A fighter. The jiu-jitsu technician. He's also bald and he has all these tattoos. He's just a big fucking man. Uh, a man, a myth, a legend. Tate, Tate Fletcher. Tate Fletcher. Tate Fletcher. What's up, Tate Fletcher, you bad motherfucker? Tate Fletcher. Tate Fletcher is Tate Fletcher. Tate Fletcher. Teddy Bear. Motherfucking Fletcher, ladies and gentlemen. That's Tate Fletcher, everybody. The great Tate Fletcher. (laughs) Tate the animal Fletcher. Tate the savage Fletcher. Always moving. There's no stillness with Tate Fletcher. You will find no dust. Tate Fletcher's in the house, ladies and gentlemen. He just said the word erection. Tate Fletcher. Tate Fletcher's in the fucking house. Tate Fletcher! Tate really blasts out some serious hardcore truth bombs, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Hey, Aubrey. Hey, Tate. Welcome to Los Angeles. Oh, thanks, brother. This is where I originally grew up, man. Is it really? Yeah. When? 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 Like you? I went your... to high, before I went to high school. So I was living out with my mother in uh, in the valley, uh-huh. out in Camarillo, Thousand Oaks area, and then my dad off PCH. No shit. Yeah, it's my old hood. When did you move to Texas? High school. Went to Westlake High in Texas. Why? My family both wanted to move. They like they didn't like the California school system at all. You know, like the there's the private school options. Yeah, if you get which are in like, the right school, it's great. But. Yeah, and and we could have gone that route, but it would have been a drive, and it would have been kind of a pain in the ass. Or and then the public school options at that point were just not good. And then Texas was just killing it. The school in Austin. Austin's a dope place. And my school was top athletic program, top like teachers, Wicked. top. It was just fucking sweet. Cool. I'm glad they did, though. I mean, I've stayed there. I've been there 20 years now. It's so crazy here. I have friends that they have a place on uh, just up the road in Venice. And the, they rent it. They got a sick uh, deal on this place that's a rental because... The people that own the house had to, their kid went from like kindergarten to first grade or sixth grade to junior high school or something. There was some kind of change in the school. And they needed to live literally across the alley to be in the right school district right. to go to the school that <laughs> yeah. they wanted to go to, and, which is really wild. It's weird. Yeah. It's a weird system. I think the whole education system is so ripe for change. When I'm giving people advice and so many people are like, I don't know what I should do. I think I should go back to school. I'm like, no. Never do that. That's never the answer. It's it's delaying the inevitable choice that you're going to have. I mean, fuck, I've hired 140 people for on it alone. And one of the last things I look at is what their degree is. Right. You know, you're hiring from the minor leagues and the minor leagues are not education. That's a whole different fucking stratosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You got to be doing something in the field that's related to the field that you want to go to. And education has nothing to do with that. Nope. I mean, unless you're 
in a spe- you want to be an auto mechanic or a doctor or a dentist. Right. Those are all real similar things that you need to have that yep. skills. But like, <laughs> other than that, man, it's I, I, I feel like it's underutilized too. I, I think how much more people people would be able to really dial in what they want to do and be potent in their choice if they went when they're like twenty seven or twenty eight. Right. And then you go, I did all this. I traveled here. I worked on these shitty jobs. I'm grateful for things that I wasn't grateful for when I was just out of high school, out of my parents' house or whatever. I, don't, I think that that just makes more sense. I also think that the speed at which information is changing has almost made the current education paradigm yeah. just defunct. Because even on the medical side, yeah, you'll get your degree and you'll understand the basic biomechanics of the human body. But the data that's coming out on the cutting edge and current is making all of the data that's been approved curriculum it's making it obsolete like immediately yeah. like new shit obsolete 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 so you really have to be just on the bleeding edge like it can set the foundation for sure it can show you how to learn i think that's what bertrand russell said is like the best thing about school is it teaches you how to do something you don't want to right. do and deliver it on time mm-hmm. like that's good yeah but other than that Dis- fucking, it, find it's another a discipline place. of the self i think is yeah. the that's it's either that or it's uh you you went to the right school because you wanted to go into politics or something and so you're like i wanted to be a senator so i go to school with all the senators kids you know yeah and when i think back to my school i look back at the benefits of it and it was i intramural fraternity sports <laughs> like that was the highlight I got to extend and like scratch the itch of playing sports that kind of mattered you know like where at least there was 300 people who really gave a shit right which was enough to scratch that itch for me because i never went on to play college ball or anything there was that and then there was like i got to take theater classes and perform in like some Richmond City Theater shows and stuff like that. Like that was dope. What was a the few driving, philosophy classes? The driving thing that got you to school. Like I'm not going to skip school today because I can't wait to X. I skipped all the fucking time. Like yeah. I knew how to game the system. You know, I had a graduated magna cum laude, but not because of an immense effort. Just because it taught me how to just do what I needed to get done. And you know, I was always a good writer, so I'd pick courses that. I was interested in and that had a lot to do with writing so like right. philosophy courses and english lit courses and classical civ courses I liked all those kinds of things that you could you had to exact critical thinking in yeah and if it was just kind of cut and paste like the way mathematics was to me i know and i know people that are friends that look at mathematics as art and they can sit there like the way a kid will play a video game all day they'll work on a problem all day. like you have to be so fucking good at mathematics to be solving have, things uh, that other people haven't deep solved understand <laughs> like deep. like that that percentage otherwise you're just solving something that someone smarter has already solved right until you get to the point you're trying to get to this guy's understanding right right, right. and then once you're there you know like sean carroll who's on rogan's podcast said he can sit down at a cafe with a legal pad and figure out new quantum mechanics formulas like that's art at that point but everything else is just something that somebody else did which i hate it yeah yeah i i don't know i i think that uh the interesting thing about that in sciences in general is the fudge room in it like it's not exact right (laughs) like that it's like this is just as much as we know right now right and that's why I, i don't know it always would trip me out when i'm like it's clear that we're not really ha- like I remember one of my surgeries I had 20 years later I had to get it cleaned up in, in, in another part of my shoulder and he looks at the x-rays and he goes uh, who did this to you oh my god as he's looking at my x-rays like I'm sitting behind him and I was like the top specialist at Michigan State University at the time you know like yeah. that was the guy and he goes man nobody would ethically do this to you in this day and age and I go fuck man <laughs> <laughs> but like that's the way it is and it's like those are guys there's guys like that doctor at MS he was probably still practicing at that time there's but he somebody, probably didn't go to any courses to no. get upgraded and there's somebody still giving mercury fillings and yes. teeth out there there's a dentist yep. somewhere around that's like just heard mercury's the best <laughs> uh, you know these new these new fangled fillings you know they're just they're just not the same as the old ones citing studies from the 40s <laughs> yeah exactly this shit was great <laughs> yeah mercury's non-toxic it's, it's good quicksilver how how much uh how many people did you start with it on it i mean me right uh-huh. and then eventually it was me and my like one like right hand every man right and then there was one customer service slash kind of assistant to help me out and then there was one fulfillment guy and then there was one tech guy so it just kind of went and then it's one by guy, one by one like yeah 
and no sourcing was me for a long time like that team that team i delayed you know i pushed that way 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 out right i mean that was like employee 25 you know like that was it was really then it was just staffing up kind of the bottom levels too like tech and then fulfillment you know started to come through where did you get templates on how to do that like walking out of well i previous i started uh yeah i mean i started a marketing company so i got to see and help other companies scale up you know so that was that was helpful like i got to help that famous fake vagina company fleshlight right right you know i worked as as their marketing guy for a while and a bunch of other industries too and watch how these things scale and um and that was really helpful just to see it on the other side and not yeah. and learn from the mistakes of everybody else sure. who, was, who was doing that stuff it's, yeah it's a huge benefit like when people talk about wanting to be monetized for something right away or like my time is worth money and all that kind of stuff just to be able to be in a room where something is functioning with high performance and then where you can see that and then go oh i could replicate that is is invaluable i mean that's the that's the school like it's not you know i think i think the biggest key to like how do you make everything your school is you heighten your awareness of every moment that you're in being Mm -hmm. learning from everybody too you know as soon as you realize that everybody's your teacher you know in one way or another whether they're teaching you something about yourself or teaching you something you don't know that's what i always thought was the fallacy of this self-made man kind of idea because i'm like it's the biggest nonsense it's the biggest stroke of the ego how do you how did you even get there because i saw a bunch of guys where i'm like he kind of is going where i'd like to go but i don't like the way he does that or i mean you know you're picking up things people everywhere everywhere guys doing it wrong guys doing it right Mm mm-hmm all that there's that there's that bronze statue that's so famous and it's this like half bust of a dude and he's like literally carving his lower body <laughs> out, of, like, out of steel and it's the self-made man right, right. i did it all my own yeah. i am you know the ego wants to be god that only solely created everything himself it's nonsense man we're a community and the community is always going to be a part of it yeah. who are your fucking customers right like who are the people you were helping who are the people what are you actually doing mm-hmm. i mean i suppose you can hype hypothesize some you know some stock market arbitrage expert who just didn't talk to anybody and found an algorithm and lives in a basement and fucking hacked a way to make money but all right maybe you were self maybe maybe you know what i mean maybe I mean, there's somebody that nurtured him that fed him that yeah, housed exactly. him that cl- you know the whole deal man exactly there's the people who were making the porn that he was every, watching to every, jerk book, off every, every night book every book that he, he ever bed. read yeah yeah fuck yeah, yeah man the, my, one of my favorite quotes was the only people you got to get even with are those that helped you and it just flips the thinking man yeah it's like yeah okay make that your business make mm-hmm. that make that was what, what it's about i was talking to dr anthony bosis on a recent podcast i had and he worked in the psilocybin palliative care trials so these are people at the end of life and they give them a single dose of mushrooms if they're depressed or anxious Crazy. and they give them a single dose cured 80 percent what is of all that of dose and is it dependent upon size how do they gauge that in a doctor it's smaller setting? than you think it was more like a one gram but this is synthetic psilocybin i think so like really clean so it's not like one gram <laughs> of dried mushrooms. mushrooms so it's yeah. like hard to be comparable yeah, yeah, you know, okay. but like one gram of psilocybin and um I'm pretty sure that's just there was like a 0.3 to 0.4 milligram to kilogram ratio I think too I'm not exactly sure on this dose but anyways, anyway he's, ta- he's talking about um what everybody's saying and like we're we're laughing about it and nobody at that point you know at the end of the life they took mushrooms they're looking back nobody's like man i really wish i would have got even with that fucker right <laughs> right, know, right, like, right 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 like that's not what anybody yeah, ever yeah, said yeah you know it's ah, i wish i would have loved more yeah you know, i wish i would have let myself be happier i wish i would have shut enjoyed, my mouth more yeah i wish i wish i would have enjoyed my friends more you know that's what people are more concerned about it's weird about that idea about getting free and and you're free of a lot of earthly constraints when you can make enough money to exist right as kind of a self-perpetuating kind of energy and and then that allows a whole bunch of other freedoms to start thinking about in that way but also if i just endeavor to have more of money or more 
You know, it's like that thing that you're looking for. Is that really what you're looking for? Nope. Are you really looking for fame or attention or this or that? Or are you looking for uh, different kind of connections and communications? You know, like that. that's where it goes. The key question of what you're saying is the you. How are you defining you? Because I think that's where we get tripped up. We use words like you and I to talk sure. about the self. But the self is a whole bunch of different things. It's the ego, it's the consciousness, it's a variety of things all intermixed. The ego is a hungry ghost always looking for more because it's constantly in a quest for superiority. And it's a necessary part of what advances life. This dominance creates sure. breeding advantage or whatever. Like, it has a purpose, but it's never going to be fulfilled. Well, it's like capitalism, though. It yeah. has a good purpose. Yeah. But without a heart, it's a cancer. Yep. And it's the same thing with the ego. If you're not continually killing the thing that makes you strong, you'll be deficient later. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? In mm -hmm. these ways that you couldn't imagine. Yeah. Yeah, you have to just become aware of it. And so that when you say I, you're not saying I as pure ego. You're saying I as my identity, my ego, my, my consciousness, my heart. You know, that heart and consciousness can be kind of interrelated. It's all these words kind of sure. fail. You know, they're just symbols for these ideas. But whatever that best... define it. Yeah, whatever yeah. that best part of you is. And you just have to be aware of this whole amalgamation of all the things you are. So then that way one doesn't run the show and convince you that it's I. Because you could say, I need more money and I, I need this person and I need that. Or you could go back to that other side of you that's fully complete. Like your consciousness, your love doesn't need anything. It's full. Why do, why do you think that's more hidden? Because that's not the default setting that humans operate by. They have to find that, search that, suppress these other parts so those doors can emerge. Yeah, it's interesting. I think it's just that we've lost the constructs that support that. You know what I mean? Like, I think we've lost the bonds that allow us to be that caring and that giving for other people. You know, like in the old tribal structures, like someone sacrificing themselves for the good of the tribe or like someone riding out ahead to meet the enemy right. before they came to their village. You know, that was not like, can you fucking believe it? That person sacrificed himself for the tribe. Right. It would have been like, there goes another hero, like no right. question about it. And we see that when things happen, you know, when like bad shit happens, like in Vegas, we see these heroes arise that act in these totally heart centered, selfless ways. But most of the time, not only do we not have the community that we care about, we also don't have any external pressure that helps force that side of us sure. out. But I think it's there. I think it's latent under the surface. We just got to develop the rituals and the constructs that help make that more prevalent. Have, have you, I mean, I'm sure you have. Have you? What is it that you think about uh, like a proper, like not even proper, it, like different ways of having rites of passage for young men and young women i feel like that's a missing component huge you know in in a huge part of like in, when you get to this ultra civilized section where it's just our comforts are, are destroying us where we're, we're killed by all of our uh ease mm -hmm. and and uh in that kind of a thing you have to kind of build your own you have to build your own um you know fortresses to storm yeah. as you will you know yeah what do you think man I've well, thought I mean, about it. What do you think? For me, I, I think there's some countries that are still, I mean, when you look at them and they go, you've got to go to the military for the next three years, and then the next three years you can go to college. Like, where they take care like of Israel. them like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's so edgy to say that. You don't want to piss anybody off. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's exa exactly. Like, they have a great construct for that, I think. And then also it teaches people, you know, in, in a lot of the old Stoic, language to be useful as a member of society know your body know your physicality know know how to scrap know how to talk know like the whole deal you know be a complete human mm -hmm. and we're not we, we kind of are settling at a base common denominator it seems like that is lower and lower as every four or five years go by I yeah mean, to, to put us into a position where you know people aren't even in a lot of ways smart enough to admire intelligence and instead deride it like it's the, the last couple of years has been the only time where i've ever seen in my life where people are like the fucking smart guy and like been like i don't want that guy to lead the ship yeah. I, I would rather have a guy that maybe isn't super useful because he speaks as i do well people have been dividing our we've been dividing our identity further and further and further into smaller and smaller pieces in this rapid struggle for superiority of the ego like the more divisions you create in identity the more you can shit on somebody for something 
someone's better than me i can shit on him because he was privileged someone's worse than me i can shit on them because they're lazy or like whatever whatever fucking thing that the ego can use Mm -hmm. to claim superiority at will and it's driving us deeper and deeper into delusion and i think a good ritual or a good rite of passage is to transcend that and transcend that and create the understanding of the opposite which is unity which is no matter rich poor where's the road that you walk down to get there I mean, because yeah, I, I don't know I how to construct that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I, I, I mean, I see it in MMA rooms and, and jiu-jitsu rooms, and you can see it because it's dying to peak. I see it at the skate park. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I see it, man, and I see, and I know dudes are hungry for that. It has to be something that gets you out of your head. Yeah. And so uh, what gets you out of your head? Like Jamie Wheel, Stephen Kotler wrote that book. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the fucking title of that well, book? Well, Stealing they Rise of Superman is the original. And, and then Stealing and, Fire was then, the latest one yeah. where they talk about ecstasy and, mm-hmm. and there's many roads. So for me, it's been plant medicine. That's mm-hmm. been one of the things that I've been drawn to as my own rite of passage to get me out of my head, to connect me to that force that's behind all things is what I perceive it to be mm-hmm. and understand those metaphysical truths. I've all, But I've also used all the other things like physical physical struggle, like mm-hmm. emotional struggle, being in an open relationship with Whitney, like that forces a really high level of consciousness or you're living in constant hell. Certainly. So like finding these things that put you up against your challenges and force you to ascend rather than to descend into distraction and drinking and escapism and whatever other things that yeah. you do. Like force you to ascend to your greatest self. I think that's one of the... the at the end of the book, Stealing Fire, particularly where they talk about being a bliss junkie then. Yeah. You know, like that, the, the danger of it. And then it was at the end of the rise, I think it was the rise of Superman at the end, where, you know, they say, well, you might ask what happens after the, you know, because your body can only take so many jumps over the Great Wall or, yeah. or whatever, right? And, you know, as an aging dude, if, the, if your envelope is so high that you can only get off if you do a, a live jump from a mile in the air to the earth to a net with no shoot. If that's the way, like, what's next? Like, what do you got to do next year to have that same kind of feeling again, right? And and there's a, a point there, I think, where guys get monodimensional and go, I'm only going to be good in these, mm-hmm. like, uh, th- except you can get there in other ways is my point, you know? Yeah, you get lost in the means of it rather than the state. Like, a person who, it's the difference between a hedonist and, like, an Epicurean, right? Like, a hedonist, because of the tolerance principle of pleasure, had to constantly seek greater and greater, more wild orgies, more exotic foods, more spices, more of everything in order to get themselves off because of hedonic tolerance. Whereas like an Epicurean realized that the true way to sustain pleasure was generally humble, meager meals, time spent with your friends, sipping a little wine, sustaining this over time and being as satisfied with less it's like if you've been on a five day fast and you eat a cashew that fucking cashew explodes in your mouth it's like amazing you know and i think we can get that way with everything we can either be riding against that tolerance principle or we can just use these ecstatic events to teach us what it could feel like and then learn how to make that an everyday waking state like i saw don miguel ruiz who's one of the biggest embodiments of someone who was living in that kind of nirvanic state and he looked out i spent five days with him in mexico he looked out at the sunset every day with his glass of wine like ah fuck this is amazing yeah yeah you know and every single day the sunset was the same the wine was the same you know the sunset was pretty incredible the wine was decent but but he looked at that life with that sense of awe every day and i think moments yeah and i think that's i think that's the model that we have to look at not chasing how many more things can i stack can i do a you know this drug with this sex and this music and blah and only that'll get me off right or can i just be happy with you know something more simpler find that in more simple one of the biggest things too is like everybody's looking inward for that too to go i just want to like what i want what i want you know it's like at a certain point, there's there's emptiness there too, and the only thing is like, when I think about a mission statement for myself, I go, how can I be most useful to those around me, and 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 be the best version of me? That's the most like, like what what's the point of building myself bigger and better and this and that if it's not to be more useful and yeah. helpful around me, right? And it's like, and and 
that's a, a real huge, huge thing that when did you when were you able to make that switch to realize that it felt better to do it that way than to do it for I was yourself? forced uh, well this guy said hey man you want to feel better help people you, oh, oh are you depressed Tate cool story man <laughs> think less about yourself you know what I mean that's yeah. self obsession is what that's yeah. called Tate and if you go out and you help somebody watch your depression get cured <laughs> and yeah you got to cure it every day you got to have to cure it some days more than others <laughs> if you let a few days go you think oh man I'm pretty good and then the crash is going to come you're always fighting a storm that's going to come there's always going to be another storm so you better fuck and uh, get yourself fulfilled in a real nurturing way as opposed to these other ways that taste good at the time but they don't have a lot of substance and it was like maybe I was in my earlier mid-twenties I guess yeah. at that time and I, I was um, and, and I, w- one of the ways I really saw it I was working at a bar and, and I, I was like fuck I need to make more money man and then my boss was talking to her girlfriend at the end of the night going God, I hope this show next weekend does well because uh, I might not make rent this month on the bar. And so it's kind of, and I go, oh, I need to make my boss more money. Yeah. Because if she's not making money, I'm for sure not going to make any money. And also, there's bigger things here. There's everybody's job at stake. And so at that point, I, I started thinking about people that I was working for. I was like, I want to serve them to the greatest good. I want, I want, if I'm not enriching their lives, then I'm a waste of time in their, in their space. You know what yeah. I mean? I, I, there's no point. To, to be here and so I was I, I kind of took that that way of thinking pretty early on I guess I mean I need but uh, it's because I ran down another road so far that it's just like fuck it you had a good idea yeah, you ran Tate? into the dead end you, you had a real good ideas are you sure because yeah. if you got more good ideas you should run them but if not we got another way you know the the funny thing you know because I've dealt with my own darkness and shadows and depressions and demons of all sorts and and what now reliably gets me out quicker is you know i know that one of the ways that i can be of service is to help people find the way out of those puzzles those traps that we set for ourselves so not only but it was never enough for me to actually know how to get out of the trap part of what gets me out of my own trap is not only knowing how to get out of the trap but then telling people so they can get out of the trap sure because then it combines yeah because then it combines helping people with actually finding the right key to do it and like both are essential because if i wasn't able to tell people i might be able to get myself out of my trap but without actually helping anybody else right it wouldn't really work right you know so it's like the combination of yeah find whatever means maybe it's like all right i gotta go running and i gotta do yoga and i gotta think about things in this certain way and I got to help somebody, you know, but, For but sure. that, and I got to help somebody is ubiquitous. Like it, it comes and rides along with yeah. every other solution that you have. It's like vitamin C might be nice or, or, you know, yeah. this or that, yeah, but you're going to need sun. fucking water every day. <laughs> and, that, and that's how I feel about it. It's like that kind of, it's like, this is a necessary nutrient. Yeah. And I think people can also get lost in the idea that when you help somebody, it can't at all be good for you you know what i mean they have this altruistic fantasy like yeah. well you're not really helping somebody because you're helping yourself too like there's a thing called mutual reciprocity sure. where you're both helping each other and almost every single fucking case is going to be that way right so don't hold people to a standard and try to tear them down if they're helping somebody and helping themselves like right that's still good yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean and that's the way it generally is it works better than before those parties were conjoined if it's better you know it's a easy it's easy yeah. math it's yeah, easy yeah, you don't yeah. have to be good at it <laughs> yeah it's like self-interested uh you know, like when you get when when it's like self-interested altruism yeah you know what i mean mm-hmm. it's like i'm i i understand that there's this and i need this to survive and so like i like without that counter i think the other thing is man is that um you as you are the the way you listen hear and process and consider is got to be invaluable to almost everybody in your life i mean that like like it, it's you know there's certain people and you go oh that guy's reliable like i can count on that about him you know and and in that is there's so much in that mm-hmm. you know in i guess it's like hanging out with harrison for me a little bit is like you know he he slows me down yeah and fucking thank god you know and that thing where you know where you'll take a breath and pause with it to hear what it is you know and so the answer can be uh, 
true instead yeah. of just palaver it's so fucking beneficial and i think that's that's the thing too is like i i, I hear guys and they get caught up they're like well who would i help or what could i do i'm like just remembering somebody's name the next time you see them is fucking huge you know yeah smiling Look. smiling somebody random yeah like actually taking the time to look them in the eye and like acknowledge the human in them mm. those moments can be incredibly special For if sure. you allow them to be yep you know it's you know it's fucking funny i was uh i've never been on any online dating platforms mm -hmm. and i was hanging out with tiana my friend and we were going through and i was like i, I expressed it i was like i've never even seen bumble or i've never swiped left right, or right right and we got on and it was fun and we you know she flipped it over to girls for me so i was looking at sure. a bunch of bisexual girls and it was like it was fun and interesting but the the thing i was surprised about is the people who i was looking at people and i could just see them doing their best to find love mm. and it was like super endearing not everybody there were some people sure. who were like look at my ego you know here i am right. all shiny and pretty and there's other other people who are just picking photos like here i am i'm not the prettiest but i want to love and i was like fuck people are awesome you know like random little people like quirky all kinds of different people as i was swiping through you know dozens of people i was like fuck that person's awesome like i want to hug that person yeah sure like they're amazing yeah and you could just see that kind of coming through what and a it, trip. It, was it was it was wild for me it's to a do trip that. the net that uh, that everything gets caught in it like that's a huge fucking net because there's all types of shit in that net. There's all know? types of shit. <laughs> and that's what I was surprised because I was expecting some really narcissistic kind of everybody just showing selfies. That's Instagram. Everybody, everybody's doing the fucking, <laughs> you know, the, that, that suit. But it wasn't that. I like it when the dudes do it and then I can see the, <laughs> the ribs. I can see the serratus. And, yeah. then, and then, then they, when they turn it and give me a little oblique on top yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. Bro, like, whatever, keep doing that. Thank you. Whatever that bottom one is where they got <laughs> yeah. no pants and they're, yeah, look, yeah. they're looking away. They're not even looking at the camera. It's like, and then that, that makes you want to look at their dick. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah, we, sl we swipe left on all those yeah. motherfuckers. See you, primal soldier. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even own shirts, Taylor. Yeah, right, exactly. He's like, I, yeah. I got this one pair of shorts, and then I have a sock sponsor and whatever. I just like to do this. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, he's fucking. I love his shit. You he know, I saw bring, he brings he brings Ziploc bags full of grass-fed beef butter and avocado and just eats them with his hands and he's that's just it. a fucking set or a spoon it's amazing dude he's just a savage so when i saw him at, at paleo effects and he's like hey because we've been going back and forth a little bit on instagram and i'm like this is just another dude to me and it's because he had too many clothes on i just and then like <laughs> then three seconds later i was like oh fuck I, yeah no man i got it yeah. yeah i've just never seen you like that before <laughs> <sighs> oh man people though man that's the if it wasn't for people and it wasn't for caring about somebody else i don't think i would do shit no i don't think like it, you imagine lose motivation. imagine if you didn't like the people that you worked with you want to yeah. do the thing you'd be like well this no you just be looking for an escape or you yeah. get like really focused on yourself or you allow your ego to trick you into thinking if you had a different car you'd feel better about yourself right, right. but that's never that did all those guys go to sedona this weekend yeah all the uh all the whole training team wicked yeah what was there 30 people there or something i saw there's at least like 15 yeah that's awesome yeah it's awesome cool. hiking together and doing the things that's wicked man it's dope man it's well, dope to have that community form around the company which is this idea well, there's a, about it's community. not it's not a company though it's an ethos you're right you know right it's a it's this idea it's a it's a it's a movement right it's kind of like it's, a, it's the same kind of thing i think that we thought about with caveman coffee it's like no man i want people to know more and i want people to educate themselves more and be more and like and for god's sakes care enough to put good things in yourself and and like it's kind of like when you start looking at it like that and you start going oh, i want to choose who i'm going to give money to because this corporate shadow is over all of our government and everything and the only way i can really feel good about myself is to not vote into it with my dollars yeah and like i think that that those kinds of things is like there's it's clear that people are hungry for that just in in that team you yeah. know in itself yeah yeah we want we want to love each other yeah like we want to love ourselves you know that's like the strongest drive sure and i think a lot of people are having to confront their shit right now yeah like, i mean i don't know if you're seeing it more than ever i've seen it with myself like man, i'm any, feeling it more this year has been like a, it's a been trip wild, for man. me you know? it's like it feels like anything that isn't 
isn't completely reconciled is coming to the surface. For me and for a lot of people that I know, if there's a relationship that's a little off that needs to be corrected, whatever that flaw is will get exposed and then you'll have the opportunity to correct it. If there's something inside yourself you haven't taken a look at, it just seems to be fucking coming out, like things are speeding up. And I think maybe it's just the collective momentum of our past delusions and our past choices, or maybe there is a, a, a kind of shift in the collective consciousness that's causing it. I don't know. Or maybe it's just the resistance of having a fucking dumbass leadership, and that's just coming to a head. Maybe it's all of the above. I don't know. It's a, there's a pressure for yeah. sure that I feel more than I've ever felt before and I think a lot of it is the climate of the, the way we are politically and, and have been like you know since I don't know maybe since Bill Clinton like before then maybe it wasn't but it just didn't seem that but I don't know man it seems so divisive mm-hmm. and so much more like when Ann Coulter kind of became more and more pronounced as like they started drawing lines in the sand even for Republicans and saying if you're not if you don't believe these four things then you're not a fucking Republican we don't need you. Yeah. You know it's like it's like you guys are such a small little cult at this yeah. point like the you, and also that's dangerous it's like it's acidic you yeah. know it's yeah. it's an awful caustic kind of environment that you create and there's no good that can come out of that and the, but our whole our whole thing is that way right now and and i think that that happens and then this whole thing with religiosity and i think the thing that runs through this whole talk is you know otherwise good people or what are you combating and i, and I feel like you're always trying to get right with your past and, and you do that and then you're trying to quiet the critic that's inside you so that you can express your true self and be and be the you that you're craving to be right and i think that those things take continual work and i think maybe that's maybe the continual job of of what we are we have to do service and be a good steward of that idea all the time but other than that it's like this fear keeps us in these circles and these divisions and it and that's pushed more and more and more and more and it's really nice to see like grassroots push back from really like a lot of the paleo and health communities and uh and and even more like all more holistic communities it seems like i mean not like i couldn't i couldn't name anything but like this whole kind of consciousness Mm -hmm. about we all want to be better i don't want to name any religion or anything but i kind of want to you know in a way also because there's there's all these things that are kind of pulling people at gravity i feel like into a more positive and powerful role because the other side is so despicable in it a certain is, yeah. way. I mean, know? what? look, I've always said, what caused the fellowship of the ring? Where all the dwarves and hobbits yeah. and elves, and it was the rise of the two towers. Like, they would have gone off and on. The dwarves, Gimli and Legolas, would have been talking shit about each other and saying, yep. oh, fuck those elves. And Giggling. they'd be like, yeah, fuck those dwarves. They can live in their mountains. Mm-hmm. But then the t- two towers rise up, and they take a look at each other, and they go, yeah. Yeah, we might as well be friends. We'll yep. have a little friendly competition amongst ourselves, but we got to fight the fucking orcs. Right. And the orcs are delusion and unconsciousness and ego and all of these internal the processes. It's not external. And Gollum is a junkie. Exactly. You Gollum know? is an addict. He's, yeah. Yeah. And that's and so that's the metaphor of what's going on. The towers are rising, you know. Hey, and now we're we're coming together. How close are you to your book being finished? Book's done, man. Really? Book is done. And it comes out April uh April sixth, I think is the date. Now. Why how do they pick a date like that? Man, it's this like tight machine that they have. They have deadlines for this, 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 this. Wicked. Yeah, like on the twenty seventh of this month I get my um like the manuscript back where they have blocked everything out in the pages and then six days I got to return edits to that and then nine days after that I got to get jacket covers and that is a lot of coffee yeah for sure man Man. this writing the book was one of the most significant things I've done because you got to really plumb into the deep that's what I was thinking is uh, and fight your fight your demons is like this is another you know and and so that's the thing is how do I break myself all the time and become new and fresh and into this new thing and I think that like that endeavoring to to write a book like to to be a, a steward of your words and write everything be disciplined to that every day I'm going to write for two hours no matter what or whatever the process is for everybody to get into that thing like I don't care what the thing is but like that kind of stuff like for me like that's the next thing like uh, how do you how do you keep yourself to a task how do you break your ego down and how mm-hmm. do you reflect upon yourself in a pow- powerful positive way and and i think the same thing about comedy man do it like doing stand up or working towards that Shit, yeah. working and polishing any kind of idea that comes from nothing and into fruition 
it, that is such a thing that anybody can do that I think is so beneficial. You know, I, I think one thing that was essential is, I mean, I wrote a quotes book, but I turned it into an online course, but it was nothing like the book that I just actually wrote. And I don't know if I would have ever wrote the actual book, or at least not for many years, if it wasn't the fact that I had, I was held accountable by my publisher. Right. You know, like I had a fucking book deadline and I missed that Did deadline. Did they pay money first? Oh yeah. I got an advance See, on that. that, that so you would have to do it. Then. I had to Fuck, do it. Yeah. I had it and I had people on my team also helping me, you know, and like I was accountable to get this done. Yeah. And I shrugged that responsibility. It's like, oh, the team can shoulder the weight. And then the closer it got, I was like, no, this has to be my book from my soul. Right. And I got to go into the deep and get it done. And for me, it was isolating myself for days at a time where I'm like a little madman, where I don't even hear the sound of my voice for sometimes three days in a row, other than to potentially order room service, because I would isolate myself in like a, in a hotel, right? Where it's just me pajamas from when I wake up to when I go to bed, maybe getting a little workout in, but if I'm in the flow, not, and just working constantly over and over. Because the problem with writing is if you stop, the first time, the first thing I do when I get back is I reread everything that I wrote, you know, because I have to get back in the flow. Sure. Yeah. So I just had to do it for like long stretches of isolation. it sucks to reread it all the time. It's yeah. better to fucking bang out a day. Yeah, exactly. I got so Because by, you know, hour three things start getting good and then i can keep cranking from hour three to 14 right without having to waste those first two hours again yeah fuck yeah rad man i can't wait thanks brother and yeah. there's like even now so i turned in two manuscripts and there's a third one coming back and i hit my publisher up uh last night because i realized i was similar like similar themes so or this book's called own own the day own your life right and it's, so it's about creating one awesome day one day that just shatters the paradigm of every other day that you've done nutritionally sexually uh -huh. physically sleep all of the things your work efficiency and the idea is to just plan out how to live one fucking beautiful kick-ass day from who you connect with to how you live heart-centered to the thoughts you process in your head to just recalibrate what a day could could be like potentially and then you're able to do just one day that's all we're asking it's not a 40-day program or right. commitment just we're just saying do one fucking beautiful day own that day and then see how your life changes after that and that's the uh that's the idea of the book and so the different manuscripts are yeah they're just different edits and different refinements and different things of that and like as i was saying so i've turned in two drafts now but then even still as i'm sitting with it and sitting going over the book in my head and all the chapters i'm like you know what i gotta edit this part because this part and I, and I emailed them. I was like, listen, I got to edit this part because uh, I'm not happy with it because there's a there's an intention there that wasn't pure, you know, like there wasn't it wasn't exactly I had other motives for writing that, hmm. you know what I mean? Like and I want this to be like a pure expression of, of are, service. Are there parts that you edited that you're like, fuck, maybe I should put that back in or I mean, there's got to be a way. You know what? I'm Honestly, a pull. There is a little bit of that. There's stuff that I was like sad to take out, uh -huh. you know, because I had like a real big, and you work at it. I had a like real <laughs> big piece on on marijuana, um, but it didn't fit at that size, yeah. right? Because you know I had this like performance enhancing plants idea, okay. and it was nicotine, caffeine, um, marijuana, CBD, and huperzia serrata, and that was and those were like the plants that I was going to really dive into. And it just, the marijuana thing, like, I touched it, but I had to take out a lot of, be a lot of stuff. It would be easy to go on and on. And it would be. And it's just, you know, so, so I have that. Now I have that chunk. And, uh, you know, and I do recommend, like, all right, here's the time. And I, and I, and I dabbled in it, but I had to pull right. a big chunk of that What's out. What's the last one that you mentioned? Huperzia serrata. Uh -huh. That's, like, the core driver in Alpha Brain. Huh. So that's, I think, you know, when I'm talking about, like, my plant allies... You know, those are the big ones for me. Obviously, caffeine, we're both sure. well aware of that. You know, coffee, tea, all the ways that that comes from. Nicotine's been one that's been super helpful for me as well. Do you chew it or what do you do? Yeah, I've been using a lot of snus, but I also smoke cigars. I, pretty much as long as you don't use cigarettes, like under no circumstance <laughs> should you ever smoke a fucking cigarette. <laughs> like you can get a lot of benefits from that. Point. Yeah, I've heard, be, I've heard great, bo like bodybuilders use nicotine a lot. Yeah, for Which sure. I never really understood. Oh, and then I know Sherpas do too. Yeah, tons of people throughout. All the shamans do. You know, like it's, it's a badass plant. Right. 
but you, you can abuse it like any plant. Sure. You know? So um, that I, was that was. Is that, that was why cool you can't have. wait till R.J. Reynolds gets in the weed game? <laughs> <laughs> That's when the first people are going to die, right? Like, yeah, for sure. they're going to like. It's I, know, I don't know, man. Some and of the weed, come after some of those like hundred milligram Chiba chews are already should be pretty much as killing Dude, people as anybody else. You're supposed to just use like a cheese grater and take a little piece of that. Thing. <laughs> I know, right? You know what I mean? Like that's yeah, like yeah. Some, some people are it's suited for, but I think if you're suited for that, that you've abused your privilege of using marijuana to yeah. such a high degree that maybe just pump the brakes for a little while, <laughs> rethink things, get a different state of view. Man, you know? I took 10 milligrams the other day and I was writing in my journal for like eight hours. Wow. Like just like 10 milligrams. Like I don't know how people eat more than that. I guess you just get did habituated. You, it gets you, that tolerance did you, thing. Uh, did you ever, did you always write in the same state of mind? Like if you if you got high before you started writing, did you? Oh no, it's totally different because you know, for sure. Like the, I'm, so I'm. It, those are different aspects, I think. Because yeah. I think of marijuana is almost like a mild hallucinogen. It's, it's like you're it different. Is. Sometimes you're, it's a strong hallucinogen. Sure. Yeah, yeah, at the hundred <laughs> milligram or whatever. But yeah. like, like so, what was your state of mind when you're writing? Well, the first thing it did was completely crush me. Like it. So the, so I have a saying that's my favorite saying. And my favorite saying, as I got from the South American shamans, it's para el bien de todos, for the good of all. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it goes, the very first thing that came to me is I'm sitting in and I have, I'm in my room and I'm like, this is going to be fun. I'm going to, you know, by myself, I have my music I'm playing. having a sleepover. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's just me and, me and Jumbo, you know, yep. going for a little ride. Yep. And the first thing it does, and I have my eyes closed, it goes, para el bien de, and then it's capital M, capital E, para and for the good of me sure and it goes here's all the ways you're being selfish and it just like went through this whole list of all the ways where i was convincing myself i was being of service when really there was you know to a certain degree a selfish motivation behind it and it was this like scathing expo i mean obviously i'm i'm pretty mindful of this Mm -hmm. but this just took it to that other level it's like you were doing this this was narcissistic you were doing this this was your ego driving this you were doing this this was blah 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 and i just i know enough now to not argue because it's always right so you just surrender to it and you're like yep all right here's where i was a shithead yeah, here not, here's where i was for nothing yeah here's where i could have been better in this way here's where i wasn't aware of these motivations here's, and so this is the first time you sat down <laughs> this was this was fucking two weeks ago yeah yeah it was two weeks ago so that starts the party and then the party continues once i get once that gets out of the way and right. i like have this moment of self-reflection where i look back at all the ways i've been shitty then, then from there i can start expanding and it opens up more freedom to really look but is that every time you started writing for this book oh no that had nothing to do with this book what I'm I'm asking you is like what state of mind because you're sitting down for a bunch of different days Mm -hmm. to write that are you mindful of what you take into your body during that time there's some times where you use any leg up that you can get sure right like sometimes it's really hard and it's almost excruciatingly painful to start writing and so in those days you'll i use whatever fucking tool i can whether that's some sexual favor promised to me by right. whitney or another lover or it's whether it's a caffeine and nicotine and weed and whatever like some days i have to throw everything it's just starting it's at, just, just throw right. everything just at right. that especially when it's like a real a subject i really don't want to get into a research that i'm really you know i really don't want to dive that deep into like you know the the nature of cholesterol or something i'm just like ah, i don't want to fucking go there i'll throw everything at it and other days it flows like it was being channeled right. through me and i'm just out of the way and all of a sudden three thousand words come out right and i finish that and i'm like fuck i'm stoked yep you know like it was wavering between both the whole time just do it no matter what it takes just get get the task done that's the stephen pressfield lesson right like right and you know I, I don't know if the muse is going to come, but I'm going to show up 9 a.m. every day and sit in this seat so she knows where to find yeah, me. Yeah, because if I'm not there, then for sure. Yeah, but I used I used every trick I could, you know, in the hard days, and 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 then just enjoyed and rode out the easy days for as long as for as long as they'd take me. Yeah, but having that deadline was and accountability yeah. was huge. So if you're like talking about comedy, especially because those are some real adults. Those are real adults. Yeah, yeah no doubt, and they paid me real money, yep. and I had real responsibility to get this done. 
like the same if you if you want to be a stand-up comedian you're putting off put a day that's in stone where you for talk sure. to the manager and you're like i'm going on stage yeah yeah in six weeks from now yeah and hold that and know that you can't weasel out of that shit yep. and then there you go yeah yeah it's a fucking and and also work at it all the time task yourself to it all the time like yeah the thing that you love to do you'll do you know yeah and if it's for the wrong reason it's not going to be fun to do after a minute no and because it still has to be exciting to do regardless of how fun it is it's going to be a shit product if it's not really you if sure. you're playing somebody else's notes sure. and you're playing somebody else's sheet music yep it's going to suck whether yep. you're writing whether you're telling jokes or whether you might be able to fool a couple other people by like mimicking something else that's mm-hmm. popular but you're never going to be satisfied with it nor is it ever going to reach your potential and not to say that, that there's not a place for that like i think the way people get good at things is they have to mimic people yeah. they mimic but then they fall in love with the thing and then their own style can grow out of that so and i know you're not mm-hmm. saying that but like that's the thing is like little it's, kids are mimics we mimic they can and everything like we mimic our favorite jiu-jitsu player or, yeah. or whatever this or that but then after you become a moderate expert like a moderate low level expert then you can really start to learn and grow on your own it's shit. A good distinction really good distinction because it's like learning salsa right at the beginning, salsa is like routine. Everybody's a salsa robot at mm-hmm. first. You know, three steps. And all we're learning any, is the words. We've yeah. got to learn this new language. Exactly. You're just learning the basic steps and a few moves. And then once you know the language, then you can start writing poetry. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And that's, that's a very good distinction because it all starts with mimicry. Yeah, totally. Well, cool, man. You want to get up here and, uh, and head up to the store? Yeah, man. I feel like we got Let's time. go laugh. Right, man. Yeah, right. good to talk to you, brother. I don't know. I don't know where this is going, uh, you either. guys. We just put this out, and we figured we'd talk for a while. Yeah, but, somebody uh, will hear it. Yeah, so be good to each other. Yeah, we love you guys. Love.